You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the uh, Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Parker Lennon and Chuck Stack. Uh, they both host the FAQ Fitness podcast, amongst other things. So, uh, guys, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Doing well today. How about yourself? Good. Good. Yeah. So, tell me, um, what's your background? What led you to creating a podcast on fitness and uh, how fit are you in real life and all those things? Chuck, you can go ahead. Yeah. So, we basically started this podcast um about three years ago, almost four years ago at this point, uh, because Parker and I have been in the fitness industry for many years. And just even the side conversations we had with each other to bounce ideas off of each other and um, kind of share information on what we thought about uh, decisions we were making in the industry or frustrations in the industry. Um, we figured that it was a good conversation that anybody would like to hear. So um, that's kind of how it started. And um, it's just evolved into what it is now, um, which is a great resource for videos and exercises for um, and programs for people to follow, uh, whether they have equipment or full access to a gym. All right. So it's yeah, for people that want to improve their fitness versus trainers, right? Correct. I yeah, think it's, it's, just, uh, it's a little bit of both, right? Yeah, I, I think it's evolved into into helping both clientele and, and the normal um, gym goer and uh, personal trainers. Yeah, I think our goal initially was really just to provide information. And then we started to realize that a lot of the uh, fitness professionals that we work with and or, you know, across the country were kind of asking us, you know, industry questions about training and, you know, more like we became uh, almost mentors for some of the other people that were really into fitness, too. So it's kind of evolved into both. Gotcha. So what what, is, what kind of perspective has it given you versus before? You know, you I don't know how many podcasts you've done, but, um, you know, when you do podcasts, I've learned you get to see what a lot of people are doing in a given industry and it gives you a better perspective. So like, how has your perspective changed on what you do? Um, I think I'd, I'd say at least for us, it's, it's kind of nice to be uh, like less critical on ourselves, um, but a little more critical on the content that we provide. Uh, it's been a fun evolution for both of us that we kind of, we started and it was almost, um, it was almost like a more chatting, you know, us just talking and, and talking about random ideas. And then, uh, now in our, you know, we're in almost, our, I think, our 85th or 86th episode, uh, we're starting to um, really organize stuff. And it just, it's, it comes a little more naturally. And we're becoming better at um, being interviewed and interviewing other people. Yeah. And I think, too, like on the other side of things, we're digging in some more research and more education than we were before. I mean, we've always been curious with uh, new scientific studies and you know, reading books, um, but we're going through like three and four books a month on um, not only fitness, but wellness and mindset and business, just because we know it provides a different perspective to what we're looking at versus, you know, like how we used to look at things, which was very uh, closed minded. So I think we've kind of expanded into a more open mindset than we had before. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I mean, I think uh, I, I know for myself, I I started out reading maybe one book a month um, when we started the podcast. And like Parker said, we're up to, you know, sometimes five books, six months, 
five, six books a month. And, uh, you know, amongst the many research articles that are peer reviewed and um, just the content that we're mowing through to be able to provide better content, um, I think is the biggest thing that, that has changed. So what does that mean? Are you finding new stuff in fitness that you didn't know about before? Or is it reaffirming that, you know, old school basics or what works best? Like what, you know, what's the overall, what's it doing to your brain's Oh, I love the subject. <laughs> I, you know, what's funny is uh, I'm doing a bunch of uh, steel mace and kettlebell and Indian club training. So I love some of the old school, like this stuff is from many, many, like 10, 10,000 years ago. Like this stuff has been around for a long time, but um, you know, I think we, we see like the newer science too. Like Chuck is really into the newer genetic stuff. We were just talking about that on our last podcast and I'll let him elaborate more on that stuff. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, that's the, probably the biggest thing that's changed personally is that uh, in four years ago, I started um, the concept that's evolved into uh, a company that I'm launching this year. Uh, that's a bioinformatics company. But um, I guess what I meant by the fact that we're mowing through more um, you know, research and more content to be able to provide content is that before it was it, it was kind of like more of a casual learning or through school. Um, and now it's almost an obsession to where, you know, we're able to mow through and, and read, you know, up to you know, 10, 15, 20 um, research articles a day um, just in our spare time um, on a topic that we're either going to podcast with somebody or a topic that somebody asked us about and we don't really know. Um, so it, it's been a, a process of development and um, continuing our own education uh, and like Parker said, we're getting into some of the topics that uh, are, we're more passionate about. Just our, our most recent one was um, with uh, Kira, and she is with DNA Today. Um, she had a, a, a great podcast that's genetics only, and that's my forte. That's what I'm going to school for. So um, it's just uh, it's been really cool. It's uh, almost a networking opportunity, also, you know, for us to reach out to other people, and um, whether they're in our industry or not, and say, hey, we like what you're doing, and let's collaborate and let's share with the world what, what we're working on. So what are, what are some specifics, maybe from each of you, what is some stuff you've learned, you know, over the past year that surprised you, maybe you've used it in your own training and it really boosted you or you've used it with clients, but what sticks out at you as being like super useful and cool that you've come across? Um, uh, me, me personally, it's been um, HRV or heart rate variability training um, or not necessarily training, but the, the, concept of measuring your heart rate variability uh, and optimizing the intensity of the workouts according to that. Um, as a trainer, personally, uh, I find it easier to um, observe what somebody's heart rate score or HRV score is um, and then develop a workout that way rather than um, kind of the traditional method of uh, interviewing somebody in the first five, 10 minutes of your session and then you know, developing a workout according to that. Yeah. And for me, it was, uh, going through NASM's corrective exercise uh, program and certification and basically applying that to many different situations. A lot of times I don't tell clients that I am applying it, but um, because it's kind of one of those things where like, oh, I don't need to be corrected. But um, as far as posture and athletic development, if you can fix a lot of the imbalances and um, impingements and things that people have going on, they're more successful and their uh, goals than they would be if you're, you know, putting them through a workout where they could, you know, theoretically injure themselves. Mm, makes sense. <clears throat> are the clients changing as you guys change? Um, are the responses from clients changing? Not just like, oh, their workout was better, but are they telling you different things as you're bringing new things to their workouts? 100% for I, me. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I think it, it leads to a, uh, a, a better um, educated client. Um, it helps us educate our clients in a more efficient manner, I feel, um, or at least that's been my experience, is that it's, uh, especially through the podcast, um, again, Kira, she had a very good way of speaking in a very basic manner uh, about concepts that were pretty deep concepts. So I, I feel like just like she was doing that with us in that podcast, I feel like that's been one of the things that this has helped me do for and with my clients is to communicate better. Yeah, I think too, it, it brings a different dialogue to the table when you can um, speak to different issues that maybe we couldn't have three years ago. And, you know, we can be like, oh, well, we actually did a podcast on that. And this is what we found. And this is what we kind of talked about in the podcast um, versus 
always saying, I don't know. Now, both of us are really good at saying, I don't know to clients if we need to, but um, I think that's definitely changed over time. Do your clients listen to your podcast like on their own? And if they do, like, do they bring up stuff that you talked about and does it, does it help your relationship with them? Absolutely. Yeah. I've had quite a few clients that listen religiously. Um, and it's, it's helped the dialogue again in that sense. Cause they're like, Hey, I didn't understand what you're saying with this. And then it helps us improve to the podcast and make it more, um, I guess, easier to understand and saying it more in layman's terms for certain people. Yeah, I agree. But I think I know- that, um, sorry, I think my clients have, uh, have also, you know, just from listening to the podcast, it gives us a, a source of reference, um, that's our own. Uh, to share with our clients. Uh, it's been kind of a, a good resource to point our clients in that direction. And that, that way, in the, if we don't have time in the session to discuss it, um, they can listen to an hour episode where we've discussed the, the topic in, at length. And then they come back with a, a more, um, a, a better educated, uh, a better education under the concept, but also um, with better questions and more clear questions on um, how we can help explain um, the same thing, whether it's diet or nutrition or um, or a health measurement or monitoring. Yeah, I know everyone's different, but are there any generic things that you would tell anyone that's exercising, wanting to exercise, wanting to improve their loss, you know, their performance and all that? Is there any, any generic things that you would tell them now, knowing what you know that they should do or look for? Oh, you go first, Chuck. Yeah, I think that it's a, it's definitely a, an individual response. Like everybody's going to be a little different. Um, I think it's it's easier to address that uh, with dealing with more people and and talking to different personalities and such. Um, I think the the biggest thing is just um, really just comes down to communication, you know, and just communicating well with the individual and um, building a, a a quality assessment of like when you go into it, and then building a, a easy to understand and very applicable um, program to where they can follow it very easily. Uh, for mine, I would say. I almost always recommend that clients do some form of resistance training. And I was a huge cardio athlete um, for for pretty much all my life. I still am, do a lot of cardio sports. But I think that strength training is one of the best things you can do for longevity. Um, And it doesn't have to be heavy, heavy weight. It just needs to be some sort of resistance training. Um, And there are multi different ways. We've talked about tons of different ways you can do that. Um, whether it be, you know, like water aerobics, or if it's something as crazy as like, you know, actually lifting heavy weights in the gym. But I think that everyone should try to find a way to learn those uh, skill sets. Yeah. How about the different kinds of clients? Um, What do you recommend for people like in their 20s versus 40s versus 60s? Yeah, what, what do you recommend for older versus younger clients or clients that, uh, you know, maybe are very overweight versus not so overweight or, you know, any big differences there? I know that um, there there's going to be differences in just the, like client, uh, what Chuck was saying with clients. Um, you need to look at everyone as an individual. So there's not a really good generic response to that. But someone that's overweight versus someone that's like 20 and athletic, um, their program could be similar depending on their athletic ability. But for the most part, uh, with someone that's overweight, you need to drop down the weights to start because they're already working with uh, a lot more weight to start with, um, with their body weight. And then with someone that's more athletic in their 20s, you know, you need to make sure the intensity is there because uh, our job as a personal trainer is obviously to push most clients and that age group in particular. If you don't push them, uh, you're not going to keep them as a client. So um, it depends. Like, it, obviously, I'm thinking about specific examples, but that's what I would say. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Parker was saying, um, I do. I know I deal with a wide range of clients from uh, anywhere from about 15, 12, 15 years old all the way to um, 80 to 90 years old. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that because people are more accepting to like, say resistance training, I have clients that are, that are in their sixties and seventies that are more athletic and more, um, just more able to do, uh, some of the tougher exercises than even some of my younger clients in their twenties or thirties or even in their teens. Um, uh, so it, again, it's, it, it's hard to give a generic response and that's actually, Another reason that we kind of created the podcast was to to address everybody because there are so many different kind of archetypes that you have to consider when you're you're working as a trainer um, that there's just so many concepts to go over and you know we're still you know four years later still coming up with ideas and and topics to discuss. Um, any general guidelines again for people um, 
number of sessions per week that seems to be optimal, length of sessions, uh, the mixture of cardio versus strength training. I actually just did a uh, corporate wellness thing before this, which is why we had to reschedule. Um, and they gave general guidelines in that, the ACSM guidelines. And again, those are those are a very general response to what people should do. It's like 150 minutes of cardio and uh, two to three times a week strength training. But honestly, uh, two to three times a week strength training is pretty good. The amount of time, like if it's 30 minutes or 60 minutes, should change with your ability level. So you should start at a lower amount of time. But I told the the people in this particular group, um, you know, they're very sedentary. And I told them that five minutes is better than zero. So just because the guidelines say that you need to do 30 to 60 doesn't necessarily mean that you need to take baby steps and eventually get to those recommendations. Okay. Um, I, something interesting that may, uh, I don't know if you guys do this, but I had heard an interview with uh, Charles Poliquin on the Tim Ferriss show, you know, a couple of years ago. And Charles, you know, I, when I've heard he's passed away, but uh, he would read a lot of scientific papers and he would try to read them in their native language. Um, he spoke a couple languages, but, uh, and he said, like, some of the exercises or muscles or whatever or protocols had different names and different languages. And I don't know if you're if in, in your research, you've uh, gone that far and tried to read papers in different languages and, you know, get to the originals. I think the only time that I've ever had that happen was uh, I found the supple leopard on Scribd and it was in, I think, Russian or German. And I <laughs> almost went through and tried to translate it because I wanted to read it so bad. Um, but I don't I haven't went that far now. That's that's awesome, though. Yeah, I have. Um, in one of my courses in college, I had an ethnobotany course that uh, was dealing with plant medicine. And um, a lot of plant medicine comes from either Ayurvedic uh, cultures or also comes from kind of like uh, even Latino cultures. And so I did have to kind of like translate a lot of uh, papers. And luckily, with technology and, and the being part of a university uh, and having access to new um, softwares and such, um, I was able to actually translate it into English and then kind of read the paper as I normally would. Uh, so I think that's the definitely the cool thing about technology and where we're at in this day and time is that, uh, you know, we can do exactly that and kind of um, share information easier uh, than before, you know, unless you, like you say, unless somebody knows a couple of different languages, they're not going to be able to interpret that information. Mm, yeah. yeah. He was saying he read papers from like the 70s and 60s. You know, he, he went real deep, so it was really cool to to hear him do I think too, like if you look at fitness, there's um there's cycles and things that were outdated maybe twenty years ago will cycle through again. It's almost inevitable. Like if you look at kettlebells, kettlebells have had this like rising and falling throughout the fitness industry and now the big thing with kettlebells is kettlebell flow. Um and that's kind of just a mixture of kind of movement like yoga based movement with kettlebells and kind of flowing each uh transition into the the next exercise so um i think we'll see more cycles of things that were written in the 60s and 70s come back again and if they already aren't coming back and if they aren't already being tested Mm. any um you know jumping topics here but uh, any behaviors you see that your clients have or other people have that you know nullifies or you know counteracts the workouts they may do, any lifestyle or diets or other things that people are doing that, uh, you know, really like would, would make workouts ineffective or is that not even make sense? Or, you know, what do you see like the behavioral side, the out of the gym side with people? Um, personally, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know if it's our culture or what it, uh, it is psycho- psychologically. Uh, however, I see that a lot of people are uh, self ta- self-sabotaging. And, um, you know, they'll get on a good track and then, you know, have one day where instead of having one food item that they, you know, have been craving all week, they have, you know, a, a full, uh, a full day of cheat meals and, um, you know, just completely nullify a lot of the work that they've done that previous week. Uh, and I think that's a hard concept for people to understand is that it's so much easier to destroy the work that you have done. Um, than just to stay on a consistent path that's maybe not as aggressive, but at the same time, you're making progress and progress, no matter how small or big is still progress. And I would say there's two things. One is a physical thing. Um, I think that alcohol is a problem in our society. And I'm not saying that in the sense that I dislike it because everyone enjoys like a good drink here and there. But with clients, it seems to be that 
alcohol leads to more drop off in sessions and uh, healthier choices that they had made previously when they're drinking just don't happen. Um, and then the other thing going along with what Chuck was saying, I think that a lot of people compare themselves to other more fit people in the gym. Uh, we had a roommate uh, that was in pharmacy school, um, temporary roommate, and he was telling me, he's like, if I saw someone like you in the gym, uh, I would be, you know, discouraged and I wouldn't want to do it because I know that I could never be like you. And I was like, why are you comparing yourself to me? You know, like I literally that week I broke my rib on leg press and I was still running like five miles and it sucked and I hated it. Um, but I live this lifestyle because it's a part of my career. And um, I would never want someone to compare themselves to me in the sense that I don't also don't judge them when they're in the, in the gym. So I think that a lot of people think that, you know, more fit people or trainers are judging them when they're, you know, in the gym, when in reality, we're actually stoked to see them there. And it's a good thing to, you know, get in the gym and we're encouraging people to come in the gym. So I think that's another big problem that I see. Okay. Do you, do you think that people can undo, like if someone works out, I don't know, three times a week or four times a week, are they literally undoing the workouts by eating poorly or sleeping poorly? Or they're just, I don't know. And if they are, like, how would they be undoing them? What's the mechanism? Yeah, I'd say so, so you definitely can. Um, I mean, there is a point of diminishing return, even with working out. Like, say that you, uh, like, a big term that I like to use lately is a minimal effective dosage. Uh, and, and they use it a lot in the medical field, in the health field. Um, to describe the the minimal amount that they have to give somebody, say a, a pharma, uh, like say a medicine, um, for it to be effective. So that minimal amount is where it starts being effective. Um, working out is just like that. Like if you work out a little bit, it's really good for you. If you work out a little bit more, it's still really good for you. If you work out to the point where you're driving yourself into the ground every time, it's really bad for you. And uh, like that's the thing I think that is still a concept that people don't really grasp is that the more is better idea is not always like true um and you know not only just by like doing too much can you drive yourself into the ground but like you say you can kind of negate all the positive things you've done for the week by ruining it with your diet or um even with uh like say your habits you know whether it's drugs or um alcohol yeah i don't say piggybacking that and we'll probably talk about this on our podcast with you um you know, not getting enough sleep, not recovering is a huge, huge problem. And that's why all of these smart devices are including uh, sleep tracking. And it's a huge thing with all the AI out there now is, you know, trying to figure out with heart rate variability, um, blood pressure, all those things, seeing if you're getting good sleep, seeing if you're staying in REM sleep for long enough, and um, if you're actually recovering. And I think that as technology advances, we're going to see a lot more results with clients if we're using those type of the devices. Okay. Well, very good. Well, guys, what's, what's the best way for, um, you know, if, if someone's local to you, where is that and how can they train with you? And then if they're not, how can they at least benefit from your podcast and all your other uh, you know, goodies that you have to share? Uh, they can find us at faqfitnesspodcast.com or on Instagram at faqfitness. Okay. Well, yeah. Parker and, and Chuck, I, and I really appreciate you guys being here. Anything you wanted to add at the end? Yeah, I mean, it's it doesn't take a somebody to be in the area to benefit from our stuff. Um, we have online pl- programs, and we also both do online training. Um, so that's the cool thing about technology, like I say, is that it's access to us to um, touching and communicating with more people in the world. So, uh, you know, if you have any questions with fitness or anything of that nature or even health-related questions, um, find a professional, whether it's us or somebody else that is experienced and uh, passionate about what they're doing. And, um, you know, reach out to a professional because it's not worth spinning your gears and wasting time and money uh, and resources to, you know, potentially hurt yourself. Okay. Well, guys, I really appreciate you coming. Thanks for your uh, wisdom and your time. Yeah, thanks for having Thank us. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials 
or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.